dash generosity and warmth of the Cretans from Abducting a General by Patrick Lee Firmer At last, on the night of the 4th of April, the sound of a ship's engine answered our third night of torch signals. Soon a sailor in a rubber dinghy was sculling into the cove and throwing a rope. In no time, our evacuees were aboard, the ship vanished into the dark, and there on the rocks, almost unbelievably after all our troubles, were Billy, Manoli and George. We loaded the stuff on the mules, said goodbye to Vasily Konios, our protector in the area, and headed inland for the long climb to comparative safety settling at last in a high ravine full of oleanders with the sea shining far below. There was little sleep for the remainder of the night or the next day. There was too much to talk about. Raki and wine appeared and two sheep were slaughtered and roasted. Spring had suddenly burst over the island and the aromatic smell of herbs had hit the newcomers miles out in the Libyan Sea. As I had hoped, Billy was amazed by the spectacular ranges all round and was becoming impressed by the dash, hospitality, kindness and humour of the Cretans. Our unwieldy caravan could only move by night. We left at dusk and a long trudge up and down deep ravines Halting now and then at a waterfall or a friendly sheepfold brought us to Skoinia, where we lay up in Mahali's house. A day and a night were lost here, thanks to the visits of a string of our local leaders, including the huge Capitan Athnasios Burzales, who reappears later in these pages, and the arrival in her mother's arms of a little goddaughter of mine. All this gave rise to a banquet and songs, this time with well-placed sentries, from which we rose for an all-night march, northeast, across half the width of the island, and over the dangerous edge of the Masara Plain. Circling round garrison towns, and using the device, in unoccupied ones, of barking out, march, or loss, in the streets, and raucously singing, Bomber uber England, Lily Marlene, or the host vessel lit, to spread ambiguity about the nature of our party. At one point, light rain filled the lowlands with flickering lights. Hundreds of village women were out gathering snails, brought out by the shower. Before dawn, we reached the lofty village of Kastamonitsa and the shelter of the family of Kimon Zografakis, who had been with us from the coast, a young man of great spirits and pluck, and a former guide on commando raids. The generosity and warmth of all his family was doubly remarkable, as an elder brother had recently been captured and shot for his resistance work. We had to stay indoors by day, as there was a German hospital in the village. Enemy voices and footsteps sounded below the windows. The upper chamber became a busy headquarters of sorting maps and gear, and sending and receiving runners, being hopelessly spoiled all the while by our hosts and their sons and daughters. High in the mountains above Kastamonitsa, in a cyclopean cave among the crags and ilex woods, overlooking the whole plain of Castelli Pediada, lived Sifuyanus, an old goat herd and a true friend, the very place for the party to hide for a few days, while I went to Heracleon to spy out the land. I reinforced the party with two additions here, Older than the rest, tough, robust, cheerful, and unshakable. 
Antoni Paparinionaris, originally from Asia Minor, who worked as a stevedore in Heraklion, and Grigori Tanarakis, a farmer from Thrapsano just beneath us. Both became godbrothers of mine later. Such a relationship, Sintiknos in Greece, Kumbaris in Greece, is important and binding. One becomes a Sintiknos by baptizing or by standing best man to somebody's son or daughter. The year before, Grigori Tanarakis had saved in spectacular fashion two British airmen who had bailed out of a burning bomber. One of them, Flight Sergeant Joe Bradley, before he was evacuated, became my signaller for several months after my former signaller, Apostolis Evangelo, or Leros, had been captured and executed by the enemy. The party, Billy, Manoli, George, Grigori, and Antoni, with Kimon as liaison with the village, and by runner with me and Heraklion, and with Sifu Yanis's vigilant up in those goat rocks near a good spring and with a whole flock to eat, would be as secure as eagles. Everyone had taken to Billy at once, and he to them. He had abandoned his battle dress with shoulder tapes for breeches and a black shirt and the cover name of Dimitri. Meanwhile, another runner, they usually carried their messages in their boots or in their turbans, had brought Miki Akunemayakis hot foot from Heraklion. He was about my age, intelligent and well-educated. None of the rest of the party were great penmen and head of our information network in Heraklion. By great luck, he lived next door to the Villa Ariadne at Knossos, just outside Heraklion, the large house that is built by Sir Arthur Evans for the evacuation and restoration of the great Minoan site. Mickey's father, now dead, had been Sir Arthur's overseer and henchman for many years. The villa was now the abode of General Krepp. My dress was readjusted by the family to look like a countryman's visiting the big city. Bleached moustache and eyebrows were darkened with burnt cork. Dye sometimes runs striping one's face like a zebra's. There are many Cretans fairer than me, but Germans looked at them askance and often asked for their papers, thinking they might be British, New Zealand or Australian stragglers disguised. My documents were made out to Mihali Frangidakis, 27, cultivator of Amari. We said goodbye and set off, boarding the ramshackle bus from Castrelli. There were a few country people taking vegetables and poultry to market in Heraklion. The conductor was a friend, but my Greek, though fast and adequate, was capable of terrible giveaway blunders, so I feigned sleep. The only other vehicles were German trucks, cars and motorcycles. We were stopped at one of the many roadblocks approaching Heraklion, and two felt polizei corporals asked for our papers. About dusk, we were safe in Menali's house in Nossos, peering out of the window with his sister. The fence began a few yards away, and there, in its decorative jungle of trees and shrubs, with the German flag flying from the roof, stood the villa. Formidable barbed wire surrounded it. I had been inside it once, during the Battle of Crete, when it was an improvised hospital full of Allied and German wounded and dying. We could see the striped barrier across the drive and the sentry boxes where the steel helmeted guard was being changed. Enemy traffic rumbled past to Heraklion three miles away. 
due south rose the sharp crag of Mount Jochtas. To the west and south soared the tremendous snow-capped massive of Mount Ida, the birthplace of Zeus. North, beyond the dust of the city, lay the Aegean Sea and the small island of Dia. East of the road, on the flank of a chalk-white valley dotted with vines, the bulbous, blood-red pillars descended. The great staircase of the palace and giant hewn ashlars slotted for double axes of King Minos. To avoid all excuse or pretext for reprisals on the Cretans, I was determined that the operations should be performed without bloodshed. The only thing was to waylay the general on his way home from his divisional headquarters at Anno Arachnes, five miles away, and to gain time, plant his beflagged car as a false scent. <laughs>